that involves the use of sexual energy in a ritual context to achieve spiritual awakening. Karma mudra practices are considered advanced and are typically only taught to students who have already mastered other forms of meditation and ritual. I would say most of you, almost all of you are incapable of that kind of discipline which is needed. Where a natural survival instinct is involved to bring the necessary awareness to that, and take that natural instinct which is trying to fulfill one kind of purpose and to make it into an ultimate possibility, it takes much more than you think. A certain amount of your life energy is dedicated to your sexuality unless you transform it. In that sense, yes, sexuality also is a door to the divine. is casual relationships that uh, exist in this nice age group that we're in. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say good things about us. So, people engage in uh, physical relationships today and um, what they lack is a lot of emotions. And we want to know if it's, it's opinion, I, I mean your opinion on it, and whether people do it by choice, is it healthy, is it you know, what to make of it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Can I tell you a joke? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> there was one Mrs. Bhatia. No Bhatias? <laughs> I could change the name. <laughs> there was one Mrs. Bhatia <clears throat> who was having her fiftieth wedding anniversary. They had a wedding anniversary and the next day she filed for divorce. The judge saw the divorce petition. He was also a good family friend. So he called her and he said, Why you want to divorce your husband? He's such a sweet little thing. Why do you want to divorce him? On what grounds you want to divorce him? She said, he's not been faithful to me, he's been cheating me. How do you come to this conclusion? Just yesterday you had your fiftieth wedding anniversary, you were fine yesterday, how do you conclude this? I got a little nostalgic and started flipping through the photo album. Then I saw none of my five children resemble him. So, <laughs> see, right now, uh, do you… <clears throat> do you remember how your great-great-great-great-great-grandmother ten generations ago looked like? You don't. But her nose is sitting on your face right now. Your body remembers, yes or no? Your body remembers even the skin tone of your forefathers a million years ago, it still remembers, not forgotten. So what you're calling as my body is an enormous amount of memory, isn't it? What you carry in your brain as memory is minuscule. What you carry in your body, there is evolutionary uh, memory, there is genetic memory, there is karmic memory. There are articulate and inarticulate levels of memory. There is so much memory. You know, you think you know how to walk right now, please understand only because your body has built up that memory. If your body forgets, you won't be able to walk. So the amount of memory for every simple thing that you do, you know what to eat, what not to eat, how to eat, you must put it in your mouth, not in your ears. This may look funny, but you would not know if you don't remember. So your body is a repository of tremendous amount of memory and it's picking up all the time. If you walk from here to here, there may be fifty different kinds of mild smells. You may not consciously notice but the body is picking it up and it recognizes. All the time it's recognizing, that's how you know what is good smell, what is bad smell, this is this smell, that is 
you recognize the different aspects of sound, smell, this, that, because constant recognition is happening. So this body memory, traditionally in this culture, we call this as runanubandha. That means physical memory that you build. You can either consciously build your physical memory or you can simply take in wild amounts of memory and go through lots of physical confusion. So wherever there is impact, I don't know if you still have these things, maybe in your generation is gone, but still there will be people in Bangalore city. If you ask them to… if you try to give them salt, they won't take it, they'll say, keep it there. Hmm? If you try to give them uh, sesame seeds, they will say, please keep it there. Because they have recognized many substances which can easily carry your memory and it will become mine if I take it. So I don't want to take in memory. This is the reason why generally in this culture, touching each other, shaking hands, these things are avoided. We touch our own two hands and do namaskaram <laughs> because we don't want to go on picking up memory. Because if I as much as touch this, this memory, it remembers. You… you try this with four of your friends, you touch their hands. Don't try to consciously remember, every day touch their hands, forget about it. Tomorrow, if that person comes and touches you, you know it's this hand, isn't it? So the body remembers, it's not the mind. The physical body remembers, this is called as runanubandha. When there is a sexual interaction, or there is any kind of intimacy which involves thought, emotion and body, the amount of memory that is left in your system is very big. It is from this context they said, you must keep this as simple as possible. There are other aspects where in certain tantric process and all they're involving, they are preparing themselves for years to distance themselves from the body in such a way that the body doesn't pick up anything from anywhere. This is being done like a sadhana, not as sexual promiscuity. So, the question is not of morality, the question is of what is it that you want to do with yourself in your life. If you want to be in such a way that in your life, your inner intelligence will be the most dominant thing in your life, not your physical body, then you must keep the body's memory as simple as possible. This is why simple types of food, you know, people go into very simple kind of food, not complicated. Even now, I eat one meal a day and I eat only one item in the meal. I won't eat ten. I may eat all of those things another day, but today I'll eat only one item because it makes a huge… just experiment and see, don't go by what I'm saying. Just experiment and see, especially when your examination time comes, eat simple food and see what a difference it makes for your intelligence, how it functions, how alert you are, everything. So, what is it that you're trying to build yourself to? Do you want to build yourself to be a sexual supernova or… <laughs> no, I'm saying some people may have that intention, that's up to them. But what is it that you want to do with your life is something that you must decide. If you have decided that, it's very, very important that you don't unconsciously pick up enormous amount of memory because this will lead to… Later on you will see, it will become very difficult to remain peaceful and joyful in your life, no matter what good things may be happening, be simply because there is confusing memories in the system. When something else of similar nature comes, the body goes into a turmoil of confusion. It may not translate into your mind, just physically it will go on. So, it's a choice that one has to make. It's not a question of morality, it is a question of living sensibly. Namaskaram Sadhguru, can one use sexuality as a means to reach one's ultimate nature? Is uh, sexuality a route to the divine? If you want to look at it that way, everything can be a route to the divine. Everything in the existence, Every atom in the existence can be a doorway to the divine if you know how to open it. In that sense, yes, sexuality also is a door to the divine. The reason why somebody might have talked about it is because in many ways it is 
a certain amount of your life energy is dedicated to your sexuality unless you transform it naturally to ensure that the reproductive activity happens and the race is preserved, the human race is preserved, a certain amount of your energy is naturally dedicated to the sexual process. In terms of survival, procreation is an important part of survival because survival is not just about your body, survival is about survival of the species. So, when the survival instinct is about the species, naturally sexuality has a certain dedicated energy towards it. Unless you can consciously transform it, it is on in the system. You cannot deny it. Maybe it is on to different extents in different people, maybe not to the same extent. In some people it may be very strong, in some people it may be just a passing phase. So can we use sexuality as a way to the divine? I would advise that you handle sexuality as sexuality rather than trying to make it into a spiritual process because that involves extreme discipline which you are not capable of. I would say most of you, almost all of you are incapable of that kind of discipline which is needed where a natural survival instinct is involved to bring the necessary awareness to that and take that natural instinct which is trying to fulfill one kind of purpose and to make it into an ultimate possibility, it takes much more than you think. Now if you have no guilt problems about the basic biology of your body, you conduct it to the extent it is necessary for you as a person. You don't have to meet the social standards, nor do you have to compete with the stud farms <laughs> around you. Yes? As a person, to what extent is your need, you please see that. Don't set social standards to it. If you go by this, if you do not get involved with what's happening in the social standards, you will see most of you need very little sexuality actually. People are egged on by what's happening around. They think if they're not like how everybody else claim to be, then maybe they're not living a normal life. Because of these ideas, they are trying to do things which are not essentially them. If you go by your own natural process, you will see most people need very little. Only a few people are hyped sexuality. Rest of them, it is not such a strong thing, it is there, but it's not such a strong thing. Once it happened, a ninety-two-year-old man went to the doctor. The doctor gave him a, gave him a clinical checkup and uh, he said, your blood pressure is little on the high. So immediately, this ninety-two-year-old man asked, does, does it mean I have to give up my sex life? The doctor asked, well, which one, thinking about it or talking about it? <laughs> the world is thinking too much about it. They are thinking too much about it, it's unnatural. Sexuality is just a small part of you. Even in this physical body, sexuality is just a small part of your body, isn't it? Why has it become so big? Simply because of wrong ideas. First of all, you have not accepted the simple biology of a man or a woman the way it is. You are trying to make it something other than what it is, isn't it? If you just look at the human body just the way it is, there isn't much too much sexuality to it. But now it's all gotten twisted out in people's mind because the ideas of right and wrong, guilt and 
punishment and whatever nonsense, it's become so big. If you simply accepted it as a part of your life, it would be a very small part of your life. Then you wouldn't be thinking how to use your sexuality to reach the divine. So many other things are playing much more important role, isn't it? Food, going to the toilet, more involvement than sexuality, isn't it? <laughs> Why did you not think, can I use my going to the toilet process as a way to the ultimate? It's more essential, isn't it? Isn't it more compulsive? Isn't it more compulsive? Then why did you not think how we can use peeing as the way to the ultimate? <laughs> Such an idea never came, isn't it? Because nobody ever told you that you have to feel guilty or right or wrong about your toilet problem. This one thing they made it so much, the more they made it, the more resistance and more struggle in your mind, it's filled your mind, that's the problem. So if you ask me, there are so many other easier ways to do it. Why try to use sexuality as a way to the divine? You know when When we started the business activity in Asia, we were thinking of what names to give for this. They had come up with many names, I said, no, all that, we'll call it Isha business. They said, it's too direct. I said, I want it to be direct. <laughs> because if you say anything else, people will have all kinds of ideas. People believe Isha can be doing only service activity and if you do business, people will come to do business with you and expect you to do dharma with them. <laughs> so with the very name I wanted it to be very clear, Isha business. We are doing business, don't have any questions about it nor do we have any qualms about it. So the same with you. You handle your spirituality separately, your sexuality separately, they are not connected. Can I connect them? Yes, you can connect everything to spirituality, possible. I'm not saying no. But why choose a difficult route? Why choose a route where there is so much compulsiveness and try to make it conscious? Instead of that, there are easier ways to become conscious. Let's dwell deeper into the lives and teachings of few individuals, exploring how they viewed the connection between sexuality and the raising of consciousness. Aleister Crowley Aleister Crowley was a highly influential figure in the world of occultism and mysticism. He was known for his rebellious nature, challenging societal norms and exploring taboo subjects including sex, drugs and magic. Crowley founded the religious philosophy known as Thelema, which is based on the idea of discovering and following one's true will. Crowley was a proponent of sex magic, a set of practices that use sexual energy to achieve spiritual and magical goals. He believed that sexual acts could be powerful rituals that when performed with intention could help practitioners connect with higher spiritual realms, alter consciousness and manifest desires. Crowley's work on sex magic was heavily influenced by both Eastern Tantric traditions and Western occult practices. In his book, The Book of Lies, Crowley presents esoteric teachings that include sexual symbolism and practices. He believed that sexual energy was the most potent force available to humans and by mastering it one could achieve spiritual enlightenment. His writings and teachings on the subject have had a lasting impact on modern occultism and esoteric practices. Osho Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh Osho was a charismatic and a controversial spiritual teacher who attracted a large following in India and around the world. He combined teachings from various spiritual traditions including Buddhism, Hinduism and Sufism with modern psychology and his own insights. Osho was known for his advocacy of free love, meditation and a life lived in the moment. Osho saw sexuality as a natural and a vital aspect of human life which if embraced and understood could lead to profound spiritual awakening. He argued that society's repression of sexual energy led to various psychological and emotional issues. Osho encouraged his followers to explore their sexuality without guilt or shame as part of a broader journey towards self-realization. His teachings often involved meditative practices 
that integrated sexual energy such as kundalini meditation which is believed could help individuals dissolve their egos and experience a state of oneness with the universe osho's approach to sexuality was deeply influenced by tantric traditions which see sexual energy as a powerful tool for spiritual transformation however osho's teachings were not without controversy as his open stance on sexuality clashed with conventional social norms leading to both admiration and criticism padma shambhava guru rinpoche padma shambhava also known as guru rinpoche is one of the most revered figures in tibetan buddhism he is credited with bringing hinduism to tibet in the 8th century and is considered the founder of niyangnama school the oldest of the four major schools of tibetan buddhism padma shambhava is often associated with the practice of karma mudra a form of tantric practice that involves the use of sexual energy in a ritual context to achieve spiritual awakening karma mudra practices are considered advanced and are typically only taught to students who have already mastered other forms of meditation and ritual according to tibetan tradition padma shambhava's union with his consort yeshi soegya is seen as a symbolic representation of the union of wisdom and compassion a key concept in vajrayana buddhism this union is believed to transcend ordinary consciousness and lead to the realization of the nature of mind which is inherently pure and luminous while these practices are highly symbolic and often involve visualization rather than physical acts they underscore the importance of integrating all aspects of human experience including sexuality into the spiritual path